India has long struggled to provide enough electricity to light its homes and power its industry around the clock. It's been estimated that by 2030, India will need to generate an additional 700,000 megawatts of power to meet growing energy demands, so the need to develop energy-efficient technologies in buildings has never been greater. I'm in Bangalore to find out more about a practical, forward-thinking residential developer that has the future firmly set in their sights. Chandrasekhar Hariharan is an economist turned eco entrepreneur who served as a government consultant on green infrastructure and environment policies and won global awards for his work in sustainable housing. Is housing really the only way to deal with the environment? Is it really the key to it? Uh, well, housing, if you look at it, is the, is the largest uh, segment when it comes to. Uh, creation of buildings. What you have coming up between now and 2030 in the next 18 years in India is three times what you currently have as buildings and about 60% of this is housing. So our focus on housing. If you go by the government of India's estimates we need about 44 million housing units right now and at the current rate of growth of about two and a half percent of, of urban agglomerations, you need homes pretty desperately. So you really believe that environmentally friendly homes are the future and they do work as a business, it's not just an ethical idea? Absolutely. There isn't, you can't build homes which will, you know, end up depending on the civic grid, the civic infrastructure grid for power, for water, for waste. You just can't build anymore because the grid can't support it. One of Chandrasekhar's projects is Z-Earth, a 25-acre development of 130 homes currently under construction. I've come to the demonstration home to see some of the green design features that make it almost entirely independent from the local infrastructure for water and power. These are homes uh, built on sustainable practices and uh, we generate around 70% of the energy that is required to light up these homes and all on our own. We use highly energy efficient products inside these homes. For example, if I speak of this fan, it looks like a chandelier for you, but this is a fan which consumes just around 23 watts of energy against 75 watts of energy which a normal fan consumes as power. Wow. And so that's one third of the amount of one energy. One third of the amount of energy that it consumes. These walls are built using something called as engineered masonry blocks. It's hollow? Yeah, this is hollow. That's one of the advantage. What it brings in is it brings in thermal insulation to you. These blocks are laid like this. Right. Okay. These blocks weigh around just 18 kgs against the normal blocks what we use, which, consume, which weighs around 35 kgs. So how much of material That's a lot of material you're That's saving. 85,000 kgs of materials what I'm saving. See how much I'm hurting the planet lesser. So for example, if you use a normal block, you would use the cement all over the surface. But in this block, you see we are using the cement only on this web surface. So again, you use less materials. Although India has large freshwater reserves, increasing population and rising consumer wealth is changing consumption patterns. Some regions are already experiencing water shortages amid predictions that availability could drop by as much as 44% by 2050. Every time you flush in your normal toilets, you waste around 12 litres of water per day every time you flush. But here, for your liquids, you have 2 litres and for your solids, you have 4 litres. So every time you're flushing, you're saying one third of water. And what about the taps? Is there anything special about that? Because we yeah. always hear we should keep our taps Yes. Off. For example, these taps also dispose just around 6 litres of water per minute against the normal taps which just dispose around 12 to 14 litres of water really? per minute. Really? Because of these fixtures itself, for example, a family of four residing in this villa itself will save around 105,000 litres of water per year. Doesn't that mean something to you? Power cuts and rolling blackouts are a daily occurrence in India, but the idea behind these homes is to reduce reliance on the grid using renewable energy sources. To find out if the idea of eco-living is working in practice as well as on paper, I've travelled a few miles across Bangalore to another Z development completed three years ago. This is what is, you see, sucking the hot air from the room. Right, this is bringing it all up. Exactly. And how is this powered? Well, this is wind powered. 80% of our electricity we own generate. 
20% of dependence on the electricity board. That's pretty efficient then. So you see, uh, these are the panels which helps me to get hot water without having any electrical geyser or boiler. So to that extent, power is getting saved. Once again, saving on my pocket and saving on the environment. Great, so it's a really eco-friendly... It is eco-friendly, sustainable, sustainable and less dependence on the grid. Why did you choose to move to this eco-housing? Um, it's because of the nature and the ambience they've given, the facilities they've given here. It's very attractive and it's very nice to live in an atmosphere like this. So where were you living before and, and how does it compare with this? Yeah, I lived in Kormangla earlier. It was nice, but there we had a lot of water problem. We used to get only twice a week water. We had a lot of power problem also. Morning to us, power cut, evening to us, power cut. We used to, we used to have a lot of these kind of problems. Here it's more uh, near to nature because of everything, the buildings, the paints and the flooring, everything what they've used here is eco-friendly. None of us have any AC uh, no here. Air conditioning no at air all. conditioning at all. Because they're given as a, a natural AC system over here, which cuts down my uh, electricity bills. Even the, uh, uh, our garbage is picked up, we segregate waste, and we get 24 hours hot water and cold water, and 24 hours electricity at what more I can ask for in a comfortable home. So how much does it cost to move to an eco-house here compared with an average house in Bangalore? It's slightly higher than the average house, but you cannot compare this kind of environment to an average house. What about your bills, for example, and daily life? In fact, I'm saving a lot on water, electricity. On AC, I don't have, I don't, I'm not using AC at all. Our AC bill, bills would have used to be at least 450 to 600 rupees a, a month. So at least 1,000, 1,500 rupees on power bill itself I'm saving. These eco-homes are already having a positive impact on the daily lives of the residents. But this kind of development is currently only an option for a lucky few. So what about the future? Do you think that other companies and the industry will cotton on to eco-housing soon? Well, the, you know, the building industry as well as the customer will begin to see that Every such certified building will mean a 30% reduction in the use of energy post-occupancy, about 20% reduction in the course of construction of that blessed building, a 50% reduction in demand for fresh water in such a building. To me, this is a microcosm of the sort of cities that will happen in the next 15 years, have to happen. This is an imperative. These are not alternatives you need to get at least 3% of the rest of the building industry to be doing what we're doing. Then in about 30 years, maybe in 40 years, we will all get sustainable. If everyone had an eco-home, we'd certainly be reducing our burden on the environment. And the fact that property developers are now building eco-homes in the centre of cities gives us all a choice. But for now, it's only the preserve of the few. Who knows, maybe in the future, we'll all have one. As the world gets richer, more of us move to cities. So it is on the cities that we have to concentrate and look for innovation if we're to reduce the amount of environmental damage we do. But in the end, I don't really think technology is the simple answer. The biggest force for change is us. We have to think differently, more environmentally friendly. We have to tread more lightly on the earth that supports us.